Hi there, friends. I hope that you're doing well. Hope that your week is going along well. Uh, I know I had told you a couple of weeks ago that uh, there wouldn't be any more Wednesday words, most likely for uh, the remainder of September, but thankfully we've been able to work that out. I don't remember how much I shared at the time, but Jackie and I have been in transition for the past couple of weeks. We uh, have had our house up for sale and had been looking for a new house. We made a a deal on a smaller house in a Fairhope, and I mean in a, in Daphne, and we're going to be moving from Fairhope to Daphne. And we thought at the time, even though we knew we couldn't take possession until the first week of October of the house, uh, we thought, well, it's going to take a while to sell our house. And it's just been a lesson, and uh, you never know what to expect, and you better be careful how you pray. We prayed that God would let us sell our house quickly, and we had no earthly idea that the answer to that prayer would be that our house would sell in four days and be a cash offer that would uh, just have our house gone so quickly or that the people would want all of our furniture too so it has been a crazy season that we've had to move out before we could move into the new house so we're in a rental so when you look in the picture and see nothing but drab white walls behind me that's because for a month we are just in a little cottage and i didn't know if we'd be able to set up to broadcast from here but but it's worked out to do that so i'm glad to be able to connect with you in this way and uh, selfishly we're looking forward in uh, two and a half weeks to getting into a smaller home in Daphne a little less space to take care of and grateful for that opportunity and grateful to have a house sold and to be at least halfway moved in this double move hope to never do that again well uh, I will tell you it's a really good season in the church right now I'm just so encouraged by what I see had an opportunity this week to sit down with the um, elders and trustees of the church and I just want to tell you, just uh, as a personal word, we are so blessed to have a, a godly team of 10 leaders that really do walk with God, that seek the Lord, and who lead out of that. Uh, just such an encouraging thing this week to, to be with them. And as we were talking through and thinking through some of the good challenges that are ahead of us as a church, needing to make decisions, just to be with folks who are really praying and seeking the heart and mind of God on things. So encouraging. Feel great about the decisions that have been made and <clears throat> the challenges that we're facing, particularly in uh, the two different campuses of our church in Nigeria. And the challenges are primarily just so many people are being reached, trying to figure out how to deal with that and make space for them. So God is doing really good stuff there. Doing such good stuff here. Uh, I love already hearing back from different ones of you ways that you're already seeking to bless the people around you if you weren't able to tune into the message on this past Sunday. It's really an important series. I, I want to encourage you to go back and listen to that online if you haven't already uh, been able to, to access that or if you weren't, weren't with us on Sunday as we're really, first of all, learning about uh, a missional lifestyle. We're talking about blessing at least three people each week in specific ways that we can do that. I've, I've had fun <clears throat> just seeking the leadership of the Holy Spirit for different people that He's put in my mind, <clears throat> on my heart, to, to reach out and to bless them. And it's just going to be fun to see the fruit that, that God bears out of that. And I hope that you'll be with us this Sunday as we press into the, the second of those missional practices that God's really uh, giving direction and a definition to how we're supposed to be seeking to extend the kingdom right here in Baldwin County. Well, we're going to pick back up in those scriptures where we had left off a couple of weeks ago. We've been just very slowly working our way through the Sermon on the Mount. We're going to make a little more progress today. The opening portion, I love every part of the Sermon on the Mount. It's one of my favorite sections in all the Bible. We're going through the Matthew account, Matthew 5, 6, and 7. And uh, in the opening verses, it's all really rich stuff, but it's it's kind of big picture stuff. It's bigger ideas. But now Jesus is going to move us into a section where his teaching begins to be really concrete issues. And uh, the passage we're going to read today is now getting really down to the brass tacks of how you live out your faith in very tangible ways in the relationships that you have with people around you. So I'm going to pick up in Matthew 5.21 where Jesus says, You have heard that it was said to the people long ago. And, th and that's how he's going to introduce several different new ideas here. He's going to do this, um, this little dichotomy of you have heard that it was said, but now I tell you. And he's, what he's going to do is contrast the system that the people have been living under where it's always been about the law and the rules and so in each case he's going to say well the law has said this so the rules of the Jewish people have told you this but now here's what I tell you and in every case he's going to raise the bar so he says you've heard that it was said of the people long ago you shall not murder and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment but I tell you that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment again anyone who says to a brother or sister Raka, that's a, an ancient 
way of expressing that you can't stand someone. It's a it's a really ugly put down. He says to his brother or sister, Raka is answerable to the court, and anyone who says you fool will be in danger of the fire of hell. Therefore, I tell you, if you are offering your gift at the altar, and there remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First, go and be reconciled to them, and then come and offer your gift. Settle matters quickly with your adversary who is taking you to court. Do it while you're still together on the way, or your adversary may hand you over to the judge, and the judge may hand you over to the officer, and you may be thrown into prison. Truly, I tell you, you will not get out until you have paid the last penny. So Jesus has hit really on three things here, but they all revolve around one idea, and this is really important practical stuff for us here today. If you were with us on Sunday or you've tuned in to that message, you know that a lot of the focus on Sunday had to do with the message of the kingdom of God and how our mission is about expressing, communicating the kingdom of God, the righteous rule of God in our lives and what what that brings to bear introducing people to that, helping them to experience that. And in our small group this week, as we were really fleshing that out, what are the values of the kingdom of God and how do we express that? One of the things that we talked about in our group is how one of you discover in kingdom life as a follower of Jesus and a student of the scriptures, you discover that one of, if you really had to boil it down to like the three or four or five most important values for the people of God and in the kingdom of God, one of the absolute most important values that you discover is the value of community. And I don't know that in the Western world we naturally, instinctively just grasp the importance of this, that to be a follower of Jesus is always an invitation to live in community. I know for most of us the biggest frustrations that we have in life have to do with just frustrations over relationships and problems and conflict that we have in relationships. And so many times I hear people express their frustrations in a way where it's like, you know, my life is great except for my relationships. My walk with God is great except for the people in my life who drive me crazy. And we all feel that probably at, at different times to, to some extent. But it's really important for us to realize that the answer is never that we get to run away from relationships, that we get to run away from community. It's become such a huge trend in American culture and in the American church that people want to declare that they are absolutely people of deep faith, but that they don't have anything to do with organized religion. And I want to say to that, then you miss the boat. You miss the point. Because to be a follower of Christ is not an invitation to get a ticket to go to heaven when you die. That's not the point. certainly is a wonderful benefit, but the message of the kingdom of God is first and foremost about what we do in life now, what we experience in life, what we communicate in life. And at the heart of it all, the invitation to the kingdom of God is an invitation to the family of God to belong in family, not just where God is your father, but where you have lots of brothers and sisters and where we must learn to live in community together. And so Jesus begins to introduce this idea by saying, you know, the the law, which is what you're so accustomed to, and he's just said in the passage that we looked at two weeks ago, unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and Pharisees, you don't get in the kingdom. Well, the scribes and Pharisees, that, that this was such a troubling thought because the scribes and Pharisees were all about keeping the rules. They were like professional law keepers. And Jesus said, you got to go a whole lot further than they go in keeping the law if you're going to have any hope of experiencing the kingdom because just keeping the rules isn't going to do that. What what does that look like? And so Jesus begins to show them what it means to do more than just keep the rules because he said the, the rules said, for starters, don't kill other people. Don't commit murder. But now I say to you, here was the bar. Jesus says, now I raise the bar a lot because what I'm telling you is it's not just a matter of you making sure that you don't kill anybody. Well, obviously we're not supposed to do that, but Jesus says, you, you got to be concerned about a lot more than just your anger causing you to go out and kill someone. You have to be concerned about the anger that you carry around in your heart. It's not enough for you to decide, well, I didn't go out and hurt somebody. I got mad, but I didn't hurt someone. Jesus said, no, the level of life that I'm calling you to live now, it's not just about not killing someone or not hurting someone. I want to talk to you about living in right relationships all the time. And so Jesus gives us then three really practical examples of of how anger can be an issue in our lives and three different ways that we can inappropriately deal with our anger. And so first of all, he says, you know, it's not enough just to not kill. I'm telling you, if you're carrying around this anger and it's unresolved, 
that's deadly as well. It's deadly for you. It's poison for you. So he gives us these three examples. He says, first of all, if the way that you deal with your anger is by venting it, you express all that anger. Said, oh, that's wrong. That that completely is inappropriate. The scripture says in Proverbs, the fool gives full vent to his anger. And he says, you know, the example of someone who's you know using this term raka, and you know, in, in our, our modern day language, it's you don't have to be very creative to think of the kind of terms that we would use to fully express our anger. You sorry piece of blah, blah, blah. You know, we, Giving that kind of vent to our anger, Jesus says, no, that that's obviously going to bring you under judgment. That's going to get you in trouble. Just expressing either to the person's face or behind their back what a fool they are, what you think of them, that just venting your anger is, is unhealthy and destructive. And then he gives a, a second kind of example when he says, if you're offering your gift at the altar and then remember that you've got something between you and a brother or a sister, what he says next is startling. He says, just leave your gift and walk out right then. You go find your brother or sister. What, what's the point of that? Well, that person is a somebody who deals with conflict in a completely different way because this is the person who hasn't expressed their anger. They haven't dealt with their anger. And it's not until they get into the presence of God in worship that conviction comes over them and it dawns on them oh i know that i've got an attitude toward this person they've hurt me i'm mad at them i'm carrying this around in me and what we would love to think is well i i I did the right thing i didn't hurt them i didn't punch them out i didn't blow up on them and curse them out so see i'm i'm doing good i didn't i didn't fully vent my anger but what jesus is saying here is you still aren't in right relationship if you're carrying around this anger if you get to church And you're in the middle of worship, and as will happen so many times as we draw near to God, we become aware of our own sin and shortcomings in that moment. And he said, it is such a priority that you need to realize God would rather see you drop your your gift and what you're doing right there in worship and go right then. Make it your top priority to go and get right with that person. Talk with them. Work through the problem. Get to a place where apologies and forgiveness can be extended and and things can be restored because the point he's making here is really weighty to to recognize don't think for a minute that you can be right with God and be so at odds with your spouse or your brother or sister or your your friend he's like this is it's that high of a priority don't think well as long as things are good between me and God I'm good to go God's calling us to live in right relationship with him and with his family. And so he says it's not enough to be a stuffer that you just held back and you didn't vent your anger. You've still got anger problems if you haven't worked through the issue. You've got to be willing to overcome, for many of us, a fear of or hatred of having to deal with conflict. We'll avoid conflict at all costs. And Jesus says, nope, not as a follower of mine. You've got to be willing to step into this gap where there's there's been hurt, there's been frustration, and now there's just a divide. There's just separation because somebody's angry, somebody's hurt. Jesus says, hey, here's a big part of expressing the kingdom. In the kingdom of God, we are committed to reconciliation. So you've got to go and work it out. And then he gives a final example. He's, he's given us the example of the venter. He's given us the example of the stuffer. I'm just going to keep it to myself and just be right with God. No, you got to deal with it. And then he gives us the final example of the person who's going to get justice. They are angry and they are going to, to take it to a higher authority. They're going to take it to a judge. They're going to sue or they're going to go to the boss and get you in trouble. You know, we're, we're going to make sure we get our pound of flesh. And that's, So it's a, a legal example. It's the third example. And man, we have turned into those kinds of people in modern American culture. Years ago, I heard a professor of psychology say one of the peculiar things that's happened in very recent modern times is he said there is a new disorder that did not previously exist among humans that has had to be diagnosed and labeled and described, and it's litigophobia, literally the fear of litigation. It's the fear of being sued because it's become such a standard response in our culture that if you wrong me, well, I'll take you to court and I'll get my justice that way. And to the extent that there are people who are freaked out all the time, afraid to act for fear that they're going to be sued. Well, it's easy to understand how we would develop that in our culture. And Jesus says, that's not the answer either. The, the answer is never, oh, we're going to sue a brother or sister. We're going to you know, bring some power to bear on them, to hurt them and make them pay the price for what they've done. And The point Jesus is making is the same at, at every level here. 
there are healthy and unhealthy ways of dealing with conflict. It's not a healthy way to give full vent to your anger, to just stuff it and carry around bitterness, or to try and punish the other person. As a believer, we're called to a higher standard, and that higher standard requires us, first of all, to always pursue reconciliation. And in doing that, here's the key that's the hard thing, and we're going to see this fleshed out later in the chapter. When we're working through really tough stuff where I've been hurt, I've been offended by somebody that I have a close relationship with, but they feel hurt and offended too, and and maybe you've been in this situation. I have. I know the reality of this. You both have felt so offended and so wronged, and you've tried to talk it out, and you just got more offended and more bothered, and it just feels like, well, there's no way we're going to be able to work this out. Here's the key to being able to get past that is getting to a place where you realize, as a follower of Jesus, I don't have any rights left to defend. I don't have the right to be offended. Because the truth of the matter is, dead people don't have any rights. Dead people don't have any honor or or anything that needs to be protected or defended. And the scripture says, I've been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. And the life that I live in the flesh, I just live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. Jesus gave up all of his rights. He had the right to defend himself. He had the right to reject all of the scorn and the false accusations, but he he yielded on every point. I'm not going to defend myself. When we recognize that the Jesus that we're called to follow models for us this example that in conflict it's not about making sure that you've got to understand my side you've got to get my point you've got to you've got to feel my pain or whatever that ultimately the one that we follow is someone who yielded his rights and as his followers he invites us to recognize we got to live like dead people who don't have rights to defend who who have the right to get offended and to to remember and keep score no our, our call is a completely different one that we yield our rights and our priority is always reconciliation forgiveness restoring the relationship because that's what jesus entire ministry was about it was about reconciliation it was about reconciling us to god and to one another and we have missed the boat we've missed out on what life in the kingdom is about when we fail to prioritize being right with each other being reconciled reconciled to one another And boy, do we ever need this. We need this in our marriages, in our families, in the church, and in the community. I'm telling you, when we begin to live this out, it is such a beautiful, winsome thing to the community around us. And Jesus is honored in that. Would you join me as we turn to him together in prayer right now? Lord Jesus, we thank you for your example. We thank you for how you love us and invite us into relationship with you and to one another. And we acknowledge to you, it's hard. It's so hard to live this out. We do get hurt. We get offended. We we, our hearts get damaged and we, we carry around this baggage. And we acknowledge to you, we need forgiveness for where we've held on to hurt and bitterness. We ask you to forgive us for that. And we need the power of the Holy Spirit, the grace that comes from the Holy Spirit to work in us, enabling us to love, to forgive, to reach out to someone that we don't want to reach out to. Lord, I pray that today you would speak into hearts that have been hurt and that you would give courage and insight to know where we need to reach out, to to make reconciliation, to, to seek to put things right. And we pray, God, for healing in relationships that have been damaged. Help us to love and to forgive and to be willing to seek forgiveness. Lord, we thank you so much for Freedom Church and what we're doing. And we pray for a continued outpouring of grace, favor, and of your Holy Spirit on us. We pray toward a great day on Sunday. We look forward to that. We give you thanks for what we're doing, what you're doing among us. And we pray for continued blessings on the campuses in Sapala and Eda and right here in Fairhope. We love you. May your name and your reputation be advanced and the kingdom advanced here. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, I really appreciate you tuning in today. Hope you have a blessed day and a good rest of your week. And look forward to seeing you Sunday morning at 10 o'clock. You take care.